Good evening. Welcome to People's University live stream. This is the seventh class in our series on entomology, bugs and people, as we're calling it. And tonight we'll be talking about butterflies and moths, as you can see. I will get to our guest in just a moment. Um, remember that if you ask a question tonight, you can win um, Adopt a Butterfly through the Wild uh, World Wildlife Fund or a glass Blanco butterfly sun catcher. And I, we've added two more gifts because of generous people. Here is a tea towel with butterflies and moths and bees and beetles, all kinds of insects on that. And the person who won Art Evans's book was very impressed, but didn't want the Beatles book. So it's back in contention tonight. We'll be giving away four prizes in total. Now, next week will be our finale with Eric Eaton who uh, is the author of Kaufman's Field Guide to North American Insects, and we'll give two of those away. And this Tuesday, Dr. Chanda Prescott-Weinstein, she's a physicist, and her book is called, um, sorry, what is her book called? Uh, I don't have it here, but it's all about uh, physics and life and politics. It's a excellent book. And that'll be Tuesday, the 13th at noon. Uh, and don't forget to get to the library. This is the last week to do it. Take a picture with our giant cicada posted online with hashtag GroodPU. And you could win the uh, artwork that Bob Villamanga created of a cicada, which is a very fine prize indeed. I wish I could keep it myself, but I can't. Okay, now, this evening, as I said, we're talking about Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths. And our guest is Catherine Hocamp. She is the former lepidopterist at Butterfly Pavilion in Colorado, entomologist at Houston Museum of Natural Science, and coordinator of the Texas Butterfly Monitoring Network. She specializes in the husbandry of Lepidoptera, which is a major insect order, including about 180,000 species. She'll correct me if I'm wrong, butterflies and moths. She is a graduate of the University of Rice University with a degree in ecology and evolutionary biology and is interested in citizen science. So she'll tell you about that too as a research tool, particularly with regard to butterflies, moths, and other insects. With the bo Butterfly Monitoring Network, she helps keep track of all kinds of North, North American uh, butterflies, including the monarch, which we were just talking about. Uh, here is Catherine Hogan. Hello, I'm gonna pull up my slideshow here so that we can Catherine get. Warren. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> All right. I have our slideshow up right here. And as Sean said, I'm going to be talking about butterflies and moths today. So uh, we are going, you've been working on this uh, series about all sorts of various insects. And so today we're going to talk about a lot of people's favorite insects, which are the butterflies and moths, particularly the butterflies. So as Sean said, I have worked at the Houston Museum of Natural Science and the Butterfly Pavilion in Colorado. And I work mostly with large showy butterflies. I also on occasion work with moths. But um, primarily, I am looking at the butterflies. Um, Sean, can you tell me, or is everybody able to see my screen right now? Let's see. Not hearing that, so I'm going to go with yes. And we'll double check it from here. It looks like my screen is actually not sharing. Sorry about that. Let me get that up again. Um, and we'll share the screen again. We did work on this beforehand, but it looks like we are once again experiencing a few little difficulties. Let's see if that one will work. All right. So um, as I said, I work primarily with the most showy butterflies. And um, the 
butterfly and moth species that are shipped to various butterfly houses for um, display. So I am still not hearing from Sean if anybody's able to see my screen. Um, Sean, if anybody's able to see my screen. Catherine, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, I got I got booted off of uh, the. Uh, we're having like a internet connectivity trouble. So uh, I see. But, <laughs> but I think we have it now, right? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. okay. Good. <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry. All right. Sorry, everybody, about that. And now you'll be able to see my screen. I did not go very far, so we should be very good. So, um, yeah, as I was talking about, I was saying that I work primarily with these really showy butterflies, these really showy butterflies and moths, to really get people interested in insects. And for those of you who have attended this series, you have already gotten a little bit of review of insects, but I'm going to go over it a bit just to get everyone oriented on what we're talking about. And we're going to just talk about a few things. We're going to go over insect metamorphosis, the two main groups of insects, where butterflies fall in that category. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about the lepidopteran life cycle, which many people have some context for, but uh, we'll go a little bit more into detail. And then we're going to talk about butterfly migration, specifically the monarch butterfly, and uh, some citizen or community science that is oriented around the monarch butterfly. And then last of all, we are going to talk about butterfly monitoring in general, beyond the monarch, and why we do butterfly monitoring, why butterfly monitoring is important, and what sort of programs uh, exist around the US. So the idea is anyone who's interested, who's watching, can absolutely join in with your own community science and um, make, make a difference with the butterflies. So here is a chart. It's just a um, insect evolution chart uh, from a genetics paper and that tested various insects and looked at where they came off. So this is for all sorts of arthropods. But if you look here, this is the group of insects, which is what this whole series has been about. So the class Insecta, go over that real quick, that comprises nearly half of all known species. So that's all categorized species. Can, uh, nearly half of them are insects. Uh, they're the largest class in phylum arthropoda. So all of the arthropods that include spiders, scorpions, ticks, centipedes, millipedes, etc. Insects comprise most of those. And you can tell an insect because it has three distinct body parts, head, thorax, and abdomen. You will see two antennae. It has, they will have six legs. And then they have this tightness, this hard exoskeleton. So when we're looking at insects, there are two main groups. There are the hemimetabolists insects. So those are the ones where they hatch from the egg and the young nymph looks pretty similar to the adult. It will grow, it will molt, it will shed its exoskeleton and continue to grow and change throughout that molting process. But the beginning, the young nymph and the adult, they have a similar body plan. They look fairly similar. Now the larger group are the holometabolist insects. So a uh, whole metabolist, you could also call that complete metamorphosis. And those are the insects like the flies, the beetles, the butterflies and moths that go through this complete metamorphosis. They have the egg and then you have a larva that looks entirely different from the adult. Then you have a pupa, then you have the adult. Uh, this graph kind of makes me laugh because that larva is a grub or a beetle larva. And then that pupa appears to be from an entirely different family than the adult butterfly, but you get the general idea. The larva looks completely different from the adult. So when we're talking about Lepidoptera, this holometabolist life cycle, this complete metamorphosis is incredibly important because you cannot support a butterfly just by supporting the adult. You cannot support a butterfly just by supporting the caterpillar. They eat entirely different things. They have different habitat needs. They have different life cycle needs. And you need to be able to support each stage of the life cycle, sometimes with entirely different needs. So Lepidoptera, those are, as I said, the butterflies and moths, but to get a little more in depth, Lepido, that means scale and Terra means wings. So scale wings is the Latin name. So you've got two pairs of broad wings and you have the coiled mouth parts or the proboscis. So Lepidopterans can only drink 
food. And that's really important going forward. And when I say that, they can only drink food as adults. They can chew. They can eat food um, in a, with their chewing mouth parts as caterpillars. But as adults, only liquid food. They have cylindrical bodies. Moths are kind of stout. Butterflies are slender. Two antennae. Uh, butterflies usually have these thin antennae with a club on the end. Moths have all sorts of different kinds of antennae. Feathery, ones that are clubbed, ones that are very straight, all sorts of different ones. And then um, flight patterns vary between groups. So why I included that is when we're looking at different groups of moths or different groups of butterflies, often the easiest way to tell them apart is in how um, they fly. This uh, picture that I included here is from the University of Texas insect collection. This really shows just how diverse of a group the butterflies and moths and lepidopterans are. And just to be clear, like this is a display that included some of the more charismatic, some of the brighter ones. We aren't even looking at the microleps, the really teeny tiny ones, all of the uh, butterflies that and moths that are duller or maybe wouldn't be as nice in this display. And still we're seeing such a huge level of diversity here. So when we go into the life cycle, we start with the caterpillar. I included this picture of Eric Carl here because a lot of people get their first intro into the lepidopter and larva into butterfly and moth larva from the book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar, which in it is essentially correct. The caterpillar eats and eats and eats and grows enormously. So the other picture you can see here is a paper kite caterpillar, Idea Loconi, and that is a, a caterpillar actually from the Houston Museum of Natural Science. That is one that we raised. And that one's almost done with the leaves. These caterpillars, uh, we would have big potted plants and two or three of them could eat the leaves on an entire like eight inch pot, big gallon sized pot with a really well grown plant in it. So caterpillars, they eat like crazy. And as they eat, they grow. So a caterpillar has five different instars, usually five. Uh, occasionally, they will pupate after the fourth instar. And so you have the first instar, which is after they have hatched until they outgrow that exoskeleton. At the point that they get too big for the exoskeleton, they shed. And then you see the second instar. So these are slightly bigger. They grow and grow and grow. And again, they have to shed their exoskeleton. Third instar fourth instar and fifth instar. And once the fifth instar caterpillar is fully grown, it will shed its skin and form its chrysalis or its pupa. So when I talk about shedding the exoskeleton, this is what it looks like. This is a caterpillar that has just left behind its hard um, exoskeleton. So when I say hard, that is relative. A, a caterpillar is kind of like soft and squishy. It's not hard body like a beetle would be, but it, it, it does still have this supportive external skeleton. And so when um, they're ready to shed their exoskeleton and move on to the next instar, the next growth phase, they will anchor their exoskeleton to a leaf and it'll take a while. They'll sit there for a very long time and um, kind of like loosen. It almost is, if you can imagine like baking a potato, the way it, the skin will get kind of like loose and like floppy as you bake it. That is about what it feels like. And then the caterpillar is able to crawl forward and will sit just in front of this uh, exoskeleton and uh, will wait to kind of harden. They're at a very sensitive stage right after they molt. That is true regardless of the molt for any insect. Here is another view of that same sort of thing. You can even see in this that the caterpillar is in the same position once it's emerged from its exoskeleton that it was um, before it shed its exoskeleton. So I'm gonna move this out of the way. Oh, sorry about that. I will um, get y'all back up. There we go. Then once that caterpillar is in that fifth, uh, uh, that fifth inch star, it will anchor itself to a surface and do what's called J shaping. So you can see in that picture in the top left, that is the same kind of caterpillar we were looking at earlier, the uh, paper kite caterpillar. And it is making that J shape. You can see it's starting to turn yellow. And so what it's going to do is it's actually going to shed its skin and form that pupa. So uh, these are various phases so that you go one to the right, and that is the pupa right after the skin has been shed. It is still very um, squishy. It's still probably moving around. 
Then you see um, on the bottom left, that is one that is mostly hardened up, but like it's still pretty soft. And then um, to the right, that is a chrysalis that is completely hard um, and will be waiting probably about two weeks for the butterfly to emerge. Then if you look at the picture on the right, that shows the, um, the variety of chrysalis. Uh, a chrysalis, of course, is a type of pupa. And the... Um, and that is what is distinct to butterflies. They make their chrysalids. And chrysalis is actually the Greek word for gold. So you'll see that there are many that have gold or have flecks of gold. And those caterpillars or those chrysalids um, are fairly common, those metallic sheens. And there is a huge, huge variety in the different chrysalids that you'd see. So all of these are different butterfly chrysalids in my hand to the right. And not only are all of those uh, different butterfly chrysalids, they're even in the same family. Those are all um, nymphalid or brushfoot butterflies. And still you see that huge variety in the shape of the chrysalis. Now, once you have the pupa, you'll have the butterfly emerge. So this is a monarch butterfly, which is a relative of the paper kite that I uh, showed you earlier. The paper kite is kind of the Southeast Asian relative to the monarch. So in that top left, you have a chrysalis not ready to emerge, um, probably getting close, but at least a day away from emergence. But then the exoskeleton, the outside of it, will turn clear and you'll see the wing shape inside right before the butterfly emerges. Then when the butterfly emerges, it is all wrinkled up. That is these ones that look like they have like a really large body, really wrinkled small wings. Those are monarch butterflies that have just emerged. And within a few minutes, their wings have um, expanded out. And that picture in the bottom right will really show you how the butterfly's wings, they expand out. And then it takes uh, several hours for the wings to harden and for the butterfly to be able to, to fly. So once again, that molting, that shedding of the exoskeleton is once again, the most sensitive time for this butterfly. So I mentioned that chrysalids are really distinct to butterflies, uh, but pupa is the word for really that in between stage between the larva and the adult for any insect. And so when you look at Pupa, they're different from moths. We don't have the chrysalids with the moths. And moths will sometimes pupate in the ground. They'll just make essentially the same thing as a chrysalis, this little pupa. And sometimes they'll make cocoons. So you don't actually use cocoon for a, a butterfly chrysalis. Um, that, but a cocoon is a silk covering that goes around the pupa. So in that picture in the bottom left, you can see that there is this pupa that and you can actually make out some of the features. So you can see, I'm gonna use my mouse to kind of circle it. These are the eyes. And then these are the antennae. These are the front legs here and here. Right here is where the wings are. And then this is the abdomen. So this is a luna moth pupa. And I can actually even tell you this appears to be a male luna moth, if I am judging correctly, because of the size of the antennae. They are larger for a male luna moth. So the uh, caterpillar, before it makes this pupa, will spin this silk covering around it, and that is the cocoon. And then the pupa is inside the cocoon. So it doesn't hurt to take the pupa out of the cocoon. A chrysalis, on the other hand, is just the pupa. Now, if you look at the picture on the right, those are Bombyx mori. Those are the uh, cultivated silkworm. So that's what silk to silk comes from, is these cocoons. So all uh, any cocoon is made of silk, but some silk is able to be used in clothing to make fabrics, etc. And the silkworm is, of course, the best known of those. Then once the lepidopterum, once the butterfly or moth emerges from its pupa, it will leave behind that kind of that like shell of the pupa and you get the adults. So here I have some feeding adults. These are various kinds of butterflies. So you can see on the right, that is a butterfly that is drinking nectar, very common food source for a butterfly. And then on the left, those are called owl butterflies. They're a South American, very large butterfly and they eat rotting fruit. That's also very common with uh, butterflies, but primarily in the tropics. Pretty much you can think about it if you're in an area where there's likely to be a large amount of old fruits on the ground, then the more butterflies will be eating that fruit. So we mostly see nectar feeders kind of up in 
the United States other than Texas and some areas on the Gulf Coast and very much Florida. There are a lot of fruit feeding butterflies in Florida. Now, butterflies as well, there are other things they eat. So I included this picture on the right of a caiman. I think this is one of the most interesting things. A uh, Many butterflies, primarily those little orange butterflies on the left side, those are called Julia Longwings, and they are known for drinking the tears of caimans. They get the salt that way. Um, when we're saying this, it's primarily going to be males. Male butterflies need more salt than females, and it's actually uh, kind of weirdly because the females need the salt in order to make their eggs. They need all sorts of minerals in order to manufacture their eggs. So when a uh, butterfly, when a male butterfly is going to mate with the female, he will collect various minerals and nutrients in the wild, and then he will give those to the female as a nuptial gift. So, um, and there, and then the female's able to use that and make the X. So that's kind of interesting. And you'll see um, the butterflies getting salts various ways. You'll also see a behavior, this can be seen in the mountains actually very frequently, where a lot of butterflies will be surrounding a puddle and that is called puddling. So the puddling butterflies are again, they're getting nutrients from those puddles. They're getting water, they're getting various minerals and they're getting salt. Uh, you'll see this um, just with any like rainwater puddles, some places you'll also see it in the tropics a lot of the time where the, a large animal has urinated and they're getting various uh, nutrients from that urine. So uh, this bottom picture, this bottom uh, piece here, you have a lot of like canids, that is a family of butterflies. And these are it looks like they're just puddling. That looks like mud, but I took this picture. And um, I can tell you they're actually on a um, very expired dead cow. Uh, those, there is probably still like a little bit left, but it's mostly bone at this point. You will see butterflies on various dead animals. That's another place that they can get their nutrients. And then the last place, I did put up this picture of a Colorado hair streak. I could not find a picture of one feeding, but um, just so you know what it looks like. Colorado hair streaks, like many hair streaks, uh, when I said the family like Canid, that includes the hair streaks, the coppers, the blues. So this is a hair streak. And then in the bottom, we have blues and coppers. So um, the like Canid, many of the uh, hair streaks will eat sap or excretions from galls. So if you were around last week watching the presentation, I know that the presenter talked a little bit about galls, which are um, these things that trees will make kind of around an insect. It's sort of a, it's a reaction to the insect. And then there'll be um, excretions from those kind of sap-like excretions. And uh, the, a lot of the nutrients for this Colorado hair streak comes from the galls. They don't actually go to flowers very often. They drink sap and then they drink various uh, excretions from other insects and from galls. Now, the last one that I wanted to talk about is this Io moth. So um, this moth is from the family Saturnity or the giant silk moths. I mentioned the luna moth earlier. The uh, luna moth is also in the same family, polyphemus moth, any of those really large moths you might see in North America or anywhere around the world. But if you see a very, very large moth, it's probably in this family. And I included this because I thought it was really interesting that the um, Saturnity family, they don't have mouth parts as adults. So since I talked a little bit about that butterfly nutrition, I wanted to mention this moth will never eat as an adult. It has vestigial mouth parts. There are still some mouth parts that at one point in this evolutionary history were functional, but they are no longer. So when you have the, this kind of moth, they'll eat and eat and eat and eat so much as a caterpillar, then they'll pupate and then they live maybe 10 to 14 days as an adult, if they're lucky, that would be a long lived one. Uh, and because of this, they have to be extremely good at reproduction. This l way of living only makes sense if you can reproduce really fast and really well. So uh, these sorts of moths, this is actually a female, so I can't show you on her, but 
all of the giant silk moths, the males have huge, huge feathery antennae. And many of them can uh, smell a female because they use their antennae to smell. They can sense the um, female from even up to a mile away. And so the female comes out. She doesn't want to use any energy because she can't eat. So she will um, come out of her cocoon. She will probably stay on that same area and she starts to excrete pheromones. The male will pick up on those pheromones and will fly to her and uh, will mate. And she will immediately start laying eggs within a couple of days and uh, she emerges with her leg, her eggs already made. So it actually is a really successful life history despite them not actually eating as adults. So that kind of gives a quick overview into the butterfly and moth life cycle. We're gonna talk mostly about butterflies going forward. But the reason I wanted to do that is that you just can't understand how to work with butterflies if you're not thinking about the whole life cycle. And so we're gonna talk about butterfly migrations next and just keep that in mind as we go forward. So as you can see on the right, these are some monarch butterflies. I'm sure those are familiar to all of y'all. They are one of the most well-known butterflies. Um, and they're actually, they're the state, the most common state butterfly. They're the state butterfly of West Virginia. They're the state butterfly of so many different places. And um, it's because they fly through so much of the US during their migration. So, um, the monarch migration is really well known. It is um, not the only insect migration, but it's the best known and it's one of the most consistent migrations. It has the same route pretty much every year. The monarch migration is shrinking. Uh, if any of y'all remember 10, 20 years ago, you would have seen more monarchs. Uh, it, it, the migratory monarchs are under threat. And then, um, and they're under threat from various things, including climate change, logging in their overwintering grounds, pesticide use, and development that splits up the migratory route and makes it harder for them to find food. And then um, one really interesting thing about the monarch migration is that the concept of butterfly migration was not widely accepted until the 1980s. And that is very, very recent. Uh, it was thought that the monarchs just uh, came, that the monarchs just emerged at um, different times in different places, and that they weren't actually flying from um, one place to another all on their own. So um, how this was eventually figured out was by tagging the butterflies, tagging a butterfly up in Canada with a little sticker, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then the butterfly fly, they could track that same butterfly. They would recover the butterfly with that sticker down in central Mexico and could prove that those butterflies migrated. So when we talk about the monarch migrations, there are two different migratory populations and they are split by the Rocky Mountains. So there's the Eastern, east of the Rocky Mountains, a butterfly population, and that is the majority of the monarchs in the world. And then there is the Western population, the uh, west of the Rocky Mountains, and those have a shorter migration, and it's a smaller migration, and it is a more imperiled migration. So when we talk about that Eastern migration, usually when people discuss the monarch migration, that's the one they're referring to, because that's the really large one. They are, they will fly to the, they will overwinter in the OML trees in central Mexico in clusters. So that is what you are seeing here is butterflies clustered in the OML fir trees. So when we talk about this migration, this is a graphic by Monarch Watch. We start so we'll start with this discussion over here in these overwintering grounds. So you have a butterfly mates in the spring as soon as it gets warm enough for them to fly. It does need to be above about 55 degrees Fahrenheit for a, a butterfly to fly. And even though they are so far down south, the OML furs are in a mountainous region, so it does get pretty cold. So after it warms up to about 55 degrees, they will start mating and the females will lay eggs. Those eggs will hatch. They uh, have to be laid on milkweed. That is the only food for a monarch caterpillar, any species of milkweed. And um, they will eat, 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 make their chrysalis, 
emerge and then start to fly north. So you can see these arrows. So you can imagine this is the um, se second generation is flying here. They're gonna lay their eggs and the same thing will happen again. The caterpillar will, they will lay their eggs. The caterpillar will eat that milkweed, pupate, emerge, continue flying north. Same thing will happen. And then they'll end up all the way up here in Southern Canada. Uh, sometimes the populations will be a little bit lower, but they don't go above this green dotted line because uh, that is where you stop seeing milkweed. So then you have that fourth generation. Those butterflies, uh, they, the eggs were laid in the north, they emerge, and that's what we call the super generation. So that caterpillar will eat, 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 pupate, emerge, and then that same caterpillar will fly all the way down south, all the way back, to the overwintering grounds. Then will overwinter will be pretty sedentary for a few months. Then will wake up in the spring, mate, lay eggs, and start that whole cycle over again. So this is a graphic that kind of goes over what I was just saying. Um, it's from Journey North. And you'll see that. So you have the breeding, you have the generation one, born in Mexico, migrate north to lay eggs. Generation two, continues northward migration. Generation three, continues northward migration. And then that super generation, the butterflies will actually look different. They will be bigger. They will be uh, buffer. They will look really strong. And they will live about eight months as compared to an average of maybe three, maybe four weeks for the previous three generations. They will fly all the way back to Mexico, overwinter, lay their eggs, and the cycle will start again. So, um, oh, I actually want to go back to this. So there is that break here with the Rocky Mountains. You, have, you see a similar thing in the Western population, but it's a much shorter migration. The butterflies are going from California up to Oregon or Washington, um, maybe to Nevada, then back to California, and you see them in the Southern area of California. So if you're reading any articles about monarch migrations, which every spring you see them, um, it can sometimes be confusing. So if you think back to maybe uh, 2019, you'll see that uh, there were some conflicting articles. There was one that was saying monarch migration is the biggest that it's been in three or four years. And another that was saying the monarch migration is so so low, like such low numbers, it, we're not sure if it were going to, it's going to survive. And that's because we were looking at two different populations. In that year, and then in the year since, um, the, the West Coast population has been um, really decimated. The wildfires have really affected it, developments really affected it, and you're seeing extremely low numbers. The Eastern population saw a rebound in 2019, um, but it's still unclear if that was a fluke or if we're seeing more rebounding uh, numbers. So the other th places you can see monarchs is you will see monarchs in captivity. So this is a picture. I included this because you see an interesting genetic thing here. The butterfly in the forefront is a white monarch, and that is a gene that's present in about 1% of wild monarch populations in the United States, uh, in the continental United States. And, but typically it will get eaten because monarchs are uh, poisonous. They taste very bad. So if a bird eats a monarch, it will then throw up that monarch. So they learn really quick. Usually a bird will maybe eat one monarch and then not another one, unless they're a specialized bird who knows how to get around the really toxic areas. But if they a bird sees this white monarch, it won't have that same reaction and would eat it very quickly. So you rarely see those in the wild. But you do see them in captivity. In fact, they are specifically bred by a lot of breeders. So um, the, when we're looking at these special morphs, they're usually like in a butterfly house or maybe released for a wedding or something. Um, there is a big breeding industry for monarch butterflies and other butterflies, but specifically monarchs to be released for weddings. And their USDA, the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, does allow for monarchs to cross state lines. That is not typical. There are only a few butterflies that that is allowed for, but they can't cross the continental divide. 
because we don't want to mix those Eastern and Western populations. But for whatever reason, you don't usually see the migration if you have these butterflies that for generations have been raised in captivity. They aren't getting the environmental signaling. So um, for instance, these butterflies in um, the, the picture were probably several generations from being wild monarchs. They, are, they would not migrate even if they were released into the wild. Now, um, I also, when I, I specifically said we don't see this many white monarchs in the continental United States, because about 10% of the monarchs in Hawaii are white monarchs. This, the population in Hawaii is not a native population. It is invasive. They do not uh, naturally occur in Hawaii, and they were brought there. You actually find invasive monarch populations all over the world. There are monarchs in New Zealand. There are monarchs in Spain. There are monarchs in various areas of Africa and Europe and Asia. And we, these are um, invasive monarchs that have been brought there and are doing well. So when you hear that monarchs are imperiled, we're talking about the migration. The migration of monarchs is um, definitely going down in numbers. But the monarchs themselves, the monarchs as a species, are actually invasive in some areas. So that's just one other thing to keep in mind when you're learning about monarchs. So with monarchs, uh, there is a lot of community science around monarchs. Because they have such a big migration, it is imperative to include the community in tracking them, or it is just impossible to figure out what's going on. As you can imagine, it'd be hard to put a chip on a monarch. Monarchs have very high mortality. You're losing a lot of them on that migration. So you need numbers. You need as many people to participate as possible. So Monarch Watch, they have a tagging program. So if you see this sticker on the monarch, this is a little sticker that uh, people can order. Anyone can order a number of stickers and then they can catch monarchs in their area and they'll put a sticker on the Monarch with a distinct ID number. Then they submit the data to Monarch Watch that says, I found this butterfly in West Virginia on this date and anything else you know about it. And you submit that to Monarch Watch. And then every winter, a large team goes down to Mexico and recovers as many tags as they can. And that is how they are able to track what the Monarchs are doing. A very small number of tags are recovered, a very small percentage, I mean, a very large number of tags is recovered, but it is a very small percentage of the people who do tag these butterflies. So that's a thing anybody can do. It might seem like it would cause uh, problems for the butterfly to fly, but monarch butterflies are extremely strong butterflies. Makes no difference. There have been a lot of studies on the butterflies um, being able to fly, and they can do just fine even with these tags on them. There are also other um, citizen science opportunities or community science. Journey North is a uh, organization where people can submit their first monarch sighting. So that's something I recommend. People will often ask in the springtime, when can I? When will I start seeing butterflies? And you can actually track with Journey North because people will report the first butterfly they see in their area and you can track the migration to see where it is. There is also through Monarch Joint Venture, there is Monarch Larval Monitoring, there is um, all sorts of monarch, various monarch tagging protocols, uh, and a whole integrated monarch monitoring program I'll talk a little bit more about later. But monarchs are one of the easiest places to engage in community science. Now that kind of segues pretty well into butterfly monitoring. And that is one thing that I am very passionate about is looking at various butterflies, monitoring various butterflies and seeing what's going on with the populations. Now, as far as why do we monitor butterflies? One thing that I get asked a lot as a butterfly scientist is what, how are butterflies important? To which, uh, I think is often meant, how are butterflies important to humans? And they do have some pollination services, but they're honestly, they're not like bees. Bees are really good, efficient pollinators. Butterflies are not very efficient pollinators. But 
Of course, butterflies are really, really important to the ecosystem. They're really important in the food chain. Uh, caterpillars are a huge source of food for primarily baby birds. They are um, just really important for the functioning of any ecological community. And because of that, if you see a change in butterfly species, if you see a change in the number of um, certain species of butterflies, the number of butterflies total in an area, you know that something is going on with that ecological community. The other reason to monitor butterflies is they're very charismatic and widely liked. I often call them a good gateway insect because people, most people, even people who want to call themselves bug people, like butterflies. And once you start looking at butterflies, once you start thinking about butterflies, spending a lot of time with them, I think it often makes people way more amenable to interacting with other insects, to interacting with those dragonflies, those other flies, the cockroaches, the beetles, etc. And so uh, butterflies are a great way to get people interested in insects. And then the other reason we monitor butterflies is that they're relatively easy to identify. Now that if any of you have ever taken a field guide out and tried to identify butterflies, easy is an overstatement. But if anybody has tried to identify butterflies and then tried to identify species of mosquitoes or flies, etc., then you know that um, butterflies are much easier than other insects. Typically, the identification is the shape of the wing, the color of the wing, the size of the body, things that are fairly easy to see. Whereas with flies or ants, a lot of the IDs will sometimes be, will require a microscope to do. So it's easy to engage the community in butterflies. Now, as Sean mentioned earlier, I used to work with the Texas Butterfly Monitoring Network. I uh, founded the Texas Butterfly Monitoring Network in 2018. And then I actually moved to Colorado, at which point I took over directing the Colorado Butterfly Monitoring Network. And um, these are both network monitoring networks that use a specific kind of monitoring protocol called the Pollard Walk, which was developed specifically for butterflies in 1977. Uh, it's very commonly used in Europe, and um, it took a little bit longer to get butterfly monitoring established in the same rate it is in Europe in the United States. Now, uh, there are some older monitoring programs in the U.S. Art Shapiro has been monitoring butterflies in California since 1972. And then the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network started in 1987 using Ernie Pollard's butterfly monitoring pro protocol. Now the Pollard Walk, that's what we call it, is also used for dragonfly, for birds, for various other things, but it was developed for butterflies and it works really well for butterflies. And what that is, is a single person will walk a route um, every week, every month, a certain number of times a year, usually between like six and nine times a year, and then will record every butterfly they see. And then they'll do it again the next year and they'll do it again the next year. And then you get a good idea of on that particular route what is happening, what you're seeing. Are you seeing different butterflies? Are the butterflies coming out at different times, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is the way these butterfly monitoring networks that I've worked with uh, function. And they're both modeled after the Illinois Butterfly Monitoring Network. So we look at differences in butterfly diversity, differences in the dates of first emergence, abundance, et cetera. And there, you also get a lot of data that is really interesting that you might not see otherwise. For instance, if you're doing the same path throughout the year, we could see really easily in Colorado last year when there are really bad wildfires, we stopped seeing butterflies. Butterflies are very sensitive to smoke. And um, we had had really high number of butterflies. And then as soon as we started seeing those wildfires in Colorado, it just, the number of butterflies just tanked. So um, that is a really important way to track butterflies. So the North American Butterfly Monitoring Network is a group of directors of these programs, people who uh, work together to form programs on the same product protocol throughout the United States. The red states are the states with monitoring programs that uh, comp comply with this particular protocol. I forgot Ohio when I made this map. Ohio also has a monitoring protocol, but they don't use the same database as everybody else, so I forgot them. 
you will notice West Virginia does not have a monitor a monitoring program. <clears throat> so I am going to talk a little bit more about other like local things for any of you who are in the area. But it is slowly when I uh, started working with the butterfly monitoring network, it was maybe two thirds of this size and it has grown since. So it's slowly spreading throughout the United States. <clears throat> so if you're interested in butterfly monitoring, but are in a place where you can't join your state's butterfly monitoring network, there are other opportunities. So the butterflies and moths of North America, Bomona, it is a website. I encourage all of you to check it out. It's a, um, it relies on data submitted by people looking for butterflies. So somebody will take a picture, They'll record where it was taken. They'll submit it to Bomona and it will get verified. And if it is verified, uh, that will count as a butterfly that was seen in that area. It's also really useful for if you're trying to identify butterflies, if you're thinking, okay, could this be a red admiral butterfly? Do those even occur in my area? Then you can look that butterfly up on Bomona, on Butterflies and Moths of North America. And you can see, um, different sightings and get a good idea of if your area has those butterflies. You can also look at county lists. This works best in really populated counties where um, a lot of people have submitted observations. In less populated counties, you might miss things just by the number of people. But you can look at a certain county, you can look at Ohio County in West Virginia, and you can see what butterflies, every butterfly and moth that has been recorded there by somebody who submits to this uh, database. So that's a really good resource and anyone can do it and you can do it at whatever rate you want. If you've ever taken a picture of a butterfly outside, you can contribute. The other thing is uh, the North American Butterfly Association does several butterfly accounts each year. So these are on certain days. There's a July 4th one and there's a few others. Um, but the July 4th one is the big one and the local groups will go out and do essentially what I said, go and find every butterfly they can in an area. And it gives us a good idea of what's happening with those butterflies from year to year. Now I'm gonna mention a few things that I talked about before. The Monarch Larva Monitoring Project is a project where you look at various milkweed plants and see if they're eggs, see if they're a larva and submit that data. Uh, Journey North, it is, you can just record if you see a monarch, you submit that you saw a monarch to the Journey North website and you were contributing to that community science. Monarch watch, watch tagging we talked about earlier. And then the integrated monarch monitoring program is a monarch program that includes tagging and butterfly monitoring and um, monarch larval monitoring includes all of those and they work together. So the reason that is just so important to contribute is butterflies don't live very long. They are very widespread. It is hard to get data on them unless you have as many people as possible looking at butterflies and seeing, saying what they see. And that data can go so far. If any of you have ever used iNaturalist, uh, it, these work similarly. iNaturalist is another community science resource that you can use. But you can just submit these animals that you've seen and scientists are able to make big conclusions from those. I, having worked with the Colorado Monitoring Network and the Texas Butterfly Monitoring Network, I've gotten lots of questions from people who will email me and say, hey, this butterfly, like I used to do research on this butterfly um, in this county, has it been seen in that county for a while? And I can look it up very easily and say yes or no, even if it's not a county that I've spent any time in. So um, working with the citizen science programs, the community science programs is really, really important work, even at the level where you do as little work as possible, where you submit a butterfly you've seen once a year, still very helpful. Caterpillars Count is a caterpillar monitoring project. I will say caterpillars are a little harder to identify than butterflies. Uh, we often talk about them like they are distinct organisms, even though they are so important and interconnected, just because I can tell you, I can ID many, many butterflies that I couldn't tell you what their caterpillar looks like. They're so different. And then I put this out just because we are a program uh, based in West Virginia. The West Virginia white is an endangered butterfly and there is um, a 
big monitoring program for it. So that is a cool local thing that can be done as well. So yeah, I have, um, people are often very interested in conserving butterflies because butterflies are so beautiful. They're so charismatic and they're just so likable. And I think that that's one of the reasons that I like working with butterflies is that you don't have to convince people to like them most of the time. You get those rare people who are not fans of butterflies, but most people love butterflies. And if you're helping butterflies, you're helping every other insect. Even when we focus on the monarch, the most charismatic of butterflies, if you're putting in habitats to help with monarchs, you're also putting in habitat to help with any other insect, the true bugs, the flies, the uh, beetles, everything else is helped by working on habitat. And as I kind of was saying, if you're one to conserve butterflies, habitat, 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 that is what you need to do. They, the butterflies are most threatened by lack of habitat, by having pesticides in the flowers that they are eating from, from um, herbicides taking out the host plants that they lay their eggs on that they'll um that the caterpillars will eat they uh, are also threatened by fragmenting of the habitat where there is a say a monarch is flying north and there is a large area where it can't find any food it can't find any place to lay its eggs because there are big cities in the middle and there's no space for that butterfly to uh reproduce or to eat then uh, that butterfly will probably die without reproducing so when we are working with butterflies, it's always habitat, putting in butterfly gardens. And when you work with conserving a butterfly, you're also conserving everything else around it. So thank you all so much for listening to that. I um, So I think we have a few questions and I'm uh, really excited to answer them and talk more about butterflies. And thank you all so much for listening. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Catherine, can you hear me? Yes, I'm able to hear you. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, are you able to hear me, Sean? Well, now it's weird. It's like I can't hear you and you can't hear me. No, I can hear you. Okay. If you can hear me, I'm going to put up some questions and you can just go ahead and. Uh... Great. Sounds good. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear you. But if you, uh, I'm assuming the audience can. Yeah, they, they can hear both of us. For some reason, I can't hear you when I turn my. Uh, <laughs> of course, off. technology. Uh, in any event, let's get to the question. Mm. Okay, why do butterflies land on me and tend to stay on me? Is it the salt in my sweat? Probably yes. So um, it could be a few different things. Uh, it is likely the salt. Um, I would notice when I was working in the various butterfly houses, if I had been all morning, you know, pulling up weeds, working in that butterfly house, the butterflies were much more likely to land on me and they would drink the salt. Now, there are other things that can contribute. The um, If you, say, have a certain soap or a certain perfume, if you see the same source of butterflies landing on you all the time, then that is probably um, some sort of fragrance you're wearing. Okay. I, I put it on uh, YouTube so I can hear you now, <laughs> but it's a little bit delayed. So forgive me here. Here's another question. Ah, uh, yes. So the functions of the colors of the butterfly. So yes, the butterflies, there are so many different color patterns and there are several different functions from those patterns. Oh, Sean, I can actually hear an echo of myself as well when I'm talking. I think through your computer. Um, so you might want to view that. But the different butterfly. Well, now. now I can't hear an echo. So now it's great. 
so you're good. Um, the different butterfly patterns contribute to uh, several different things. So one of those is called aposematic coloring. A lot of butterflies are poisonous. A lot of very brightly colored butterflies. It's nothing you would need to worry about if like you were out and about and a brightly colored butterfly landed on you. Um, you would have to eat it, but you would, should never eat a brightly colored butterfly. Uh, they will likely be poisonous. And so some butterflies are giving warning colors. So for instance, the monarch butterfly, it is poisonous. It sequesters a toxic chemical in milkweed into its gut. And if a bird ate it, that bird would get pretty sick. So then a bird will eat it, will get sick, and then won't eat that butterfly going forward. So you'll see those bright warning colors, that orange and black. Now, if you look at the Viceroy, so um, I don't know if y'all saw in the background of this uh, talk, there is a little like Viceroy butterfly. It looks just like a monarch, but it has one extra line. So I know it's a Viceroy. And the Viceroy is not poisonous, but it looks so much like a monarch that birds will uh, avoid it. So that is one big reason for the bright colors. Now, there are others as well. Uh, for mating, you'll see if you have a butterfly that the female is fairly dull and the male is very bright, that usually means that the coloration is for mating. The female is looking for that brightly colored butterfly. And then there is some for camouflage. So if um, even the very bright colors can sometimes really uh, help out with camouflage and um, can will camouflage certain fruits with certain leaves, certain flowers. And then also sometimes the colors will direct a predator towards an area on that butterfly that cannot, that isn't as sensitive. So for instance, with those owl butterflies that I um, showed earlier, they had these big eye spots on their wings and they look like they might scare away a predator, but there's some thought that it might be because a bird would try to peck at the eyes they know that's the sensitive part of an owl. So if the bird pecks at the eyes, uh, that owl butterfly will actually be fine. It's far enough down on the wing that even if they lose part of that wing, it won't uh, affect their survival rate for too much. So um, sometimes those colors are misdirection. All right, let's try another one. Great. Oh, yes. So why do caterpillars look so different from the butterflies they morph into? That's a good question. Um, it's because they're in completely different ecological niches. So they have different needs. Uh, they so if you're looking at, say, a swallowtail butterfly, uh, you'll actually, the caterpillars will change the way they will look different throughout their um, life cycle. When they're younger, they look a lot like bird poop. When they're older, they kind of like get these big fake eyes that look sort of like a snake head um, from a lot of swallowtails. So when you see something like that, you can think about it wouldn't be useful for the butterfly. It wouldn't increase that butterfly's survival uh, chances if no, it no, looked like birds, per say. Because once you have a butterfly, the butterfly need to find a mate, lay eggs if it's a female, and um, no, and that is about it. Like they they need to reproduce. Reproduction is the highest goal. With a caterpillar, eating and survival is the highest goal. So they have different needs in these different stages. So the things that increase their uh, survival are completely different. So you'll often see a caterpillar that would really well camouflage as a caterpillar look completely different, but maybe still camouflage as an adult is going to be in a different environment in a different ecosystem. You will occasionally see caterpillars that are the same color patterns as the adult. That's not uncommon either. Um, because they do get those colors, the ability to make those colors from the plants that they eat as caterpillars. Ooh, birds can see other wavelengths than we can. Can butterflies do this? Yes, they can. So um, butterflies can see ultraviolet light and there are some colors we can see that they don't see as well. And that's actually one of the difficulties when you have butterflies in captivity, when you have butterflies in like a butterfly house, like the ones I used to work in, is um, I would make artificial nectars and I would put them with sponges, sponges that kind of like look like the colors of the flowers they would go to. And um, then the butterflies could get that sugar water, essentially, same sort of thing you'd give a hummingbird. 
And um, one of the difficulties with doing that is not knowing if the butterflies are seeing the same things I am. It was very much trial and error because if I put out a shade of blue, that might look different to the butterfly than the, what they're seeing because they can see ultraviolet, because they can see wavelengths of colors, we can't. Uh, their vision is very, very different. Now, interestingly, caterpillar vision is um, pretty much just light dark. They have very poor eyesight. When can we expect the monarch butterfly in the Wheeling, West Virginia area? That is a great question. So um, I actually should have seen where the butterflies are at in their migration. I am not sure. Um, I'm a transplant in Colorado from Texas, so both have very different monarch migration patterns. But what I suggest is uh, go to Journey North, one of the uh, sites that I mentioned a bunch. And um, you can see where people are reporting their butterfly sightings and um, when they might be there. I can for sure tell you that you'll see them this fall, um, probably in early September. Oh, how does the super generation of monarchs know that they are the super generation? That is one of the biggest mysteries of the butterfly world. If I could answer that confidently, I would be able to publish a lot of stuff, but I can give you some of the ideas. So um, one of the things that might stimulate that the super generation is photo period, is the period of light during the day, um, because those are the butterflies that are born very far north. And so um, with less light, that might um, trigger certain genes in the uh, butterfly that will affect their, their, their genetics, their phenotype, and they'll be larger and they'll be stronger. Um, the other ideas are um, you get different species of milkweed as you go further. So some species of milkweed, it's, it's a mystery. Um, that is one of the things that a lot of uh, people who specialize in monarchs are looking into. Ooh, do the metallic flecks in the chrysalises serve any purpose? Are they actually metallic compounds or is it just a reflection of light that mimics gold and other metal? Great question. So um, I'm gonna answer the second question first. Uh, they are uh, the reflection of light that mimics um, the metal. Uh, some people think that it's the reflection of light through the like butterfly, the scales and butterfly wings. Um, and as far as what purpose they serve, again, it's a thing that's not fully known. Um, one of the theories I've heard is that it actually helps with camouflage because they kind of look like the light shining through leaves or like droplets of water, of dew water on um, leaves. And so that having that little bit of shine will make it look more um, natural and keep predators away. Uh, I think that is very plausible having looked for some of the those shiny even those bright gold chrysalids that I had in the um the PowerPoint those are were ones that I had raised when I was in Houston and um they would be on these plants I knew they were there and I would have to search so hard and you wouldn't think I would have had to search so hard to find a bright gold chrysalis but it would blend in with the light shining and all of that it actually was very well camouflaged Okay, let me just paint the picture for you. I'm not making excuses. <laughs> I'm holding my 20 year old Chihuahua Rooney. I can't hear Catherine. So I'm listening on YouTube through my phone and there's like a five second delay. So I'm behind on everything, but we are gonna make it through this. And I am now, since we are out of questions and they were all very good questions, thank you. I'm now going to draw the four prize winners. So. Here's the first one. Bear with me. And now, and now my cat's jumped on top of the. <laughs> oh, I am sorry, people. No matter what we do, there will be. Okay, the winner of the uh, Blanco Suncatcher is Bonnie, Bonnie Thurston. And now the winner of the. Mon Adopt a Monarch Butterfly World Wildlife Fund. Let me unravel this one. Uh, 
That winner is Sharon Slocan. I'm holding this up like it's a walkie-talkie, but it's really just to listen in case <laughs> Catherine says it. Okay, Sharon, you've won the uh, Adopt Your Adopting Monarch Butterflies. And that, now the Beetle Book by Dr. Evans. And that goes to our friend Mitch. Mitch had it from Later Alligator, our favorite restaurant here at the library. And finally, the winner of the tea towel with many insects on it. is Don. Don, I didn't write your last name. Don Virginia Schilling. You have won the tea towel. So if you want something, get in touch by message or email. Let me know your mailing address or if you can stop by at the library if you're local and you can pick up your prize. The Blanco glass isn't in yet. We're waiting for that shipment, but uh, when it comes in, I'll let uh, everyone who's won know that it's there. Catherine, thank you very much and thank you for bearing with us. Absolutely. Uh, despite the technical problems that we tried so hard to circumvent. <laughs> yeah. And they still got us. But it was a lovely program and uh, uh, very informative. So thank you. And next week, Eric Eaton will be here. And we'll try once again to do a flawless program for you. Uh, and that'll be our finale. And we'll do the big prize drawing on the cicada. You still have a chance to go to the library. Take a picture with that giant cicada and post it online so that you can win the prize. It's a really nice work of art. So uh, I'll, we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.